Welcome to the Hospital Finance Podcast, your go-to source for information and insights that can help you stay ahead of the challenges impacting healthcare finance. And now, the host of the Hospital Finance Podcast, Michael Passanate. Hi, this is Mike Passanate, and welcome back to the Hospital Finance Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jonathan Wick, a principal in the Healthcare Solutions Division at TransUnion. Jonathan is the author of a book entitled Healthcare Revolution, The Patient is the New Payer. On today's show, Jonathan is going to talk with us about this new reality and discuss some ideas for engaging patients more effectively about the financial aspects of their care. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So your book is broken into three parts, uh, how we got here, where we are now, and what happens next. And for this discussion, I'd really like to focus on that third section, what happens next. Um, and in that section, you explore how healthcare could learn from other industries' customer service experiences, including restaurants, airlines, and Amazon. I love those analogs, so I'm anxious to talk with you about them. Um, obviously, those industries do manage their customer experiences quite differently than we do in healthcare. So can you walk us through a few of the examples you mentioned in the book? Yeah, sure. You know, I think I'll start with restaurants. They seem to have um, some, some, some of the latest innovations. I don't know if you've been to a you know, a Chili's or maybe a, 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 a rock bottom or, you know, any of these chains. But, you know, I, I think someday, whether we like it or not, we may see a wait, waiter or waiter waitressless experience. <laughs> or maybe yeah. we want that. But, you know, you can almost order you know, uh, through those and pay um, and have, you know, your bill there or, or, you know, order an online menu. I'm seeing that as well and actually pick the food up and eat it in your own home. They've got dedicated parking spots there because that's just what their customers want. Um, you can see what the weight is. You can, uh, uh, you know, understand the busiest time. Uh, you could call ahead. Um, that, that's a very interesting way of delivering food to where before you kind of roll the dice and make sure you got there before, you know, 5 or 5.30 or 6 on a Friday night. Otherwise, you knew you'd be waiting two or three hours and we're pretty much in the dark. But in the last decade, we've really seen some innovations there. Um, in the in the auto industry, uh, specifically in the mechanics area, you know that's that's really evolved uh, quite a bit too for the customer. I think you can shop and compare things like tires, oil changes, transmissions, clutches. Um, uh, you could see what the wait time is. Uh, you could chat. You know, figure that out. Um, they could text you. Um, there's apps too out there where they could tell you, yeah, we know what that is and, and where they're going. The book talks through that. A little bit, and then finally, in the airlines, uh, the, the the joke I like to say there is, you know, I fly quite a bit in my job, and um, I I don't really talk to anybody um, about what I'm doing uh, when I'm flying, other than you know what I'd like to have to drink when I'm on the plane. Um, but I pretty much you know pick my seat uh, at the time I'm going to fly, where I'm going, when I'm going to come back, whether my bags need to come with me or not, or I'm going to pay for them, the size of the seat I'm in, the time of day, the type of plane. Uh, the the uh, the the airports in which I'm going to go, all from my phone, um, and 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 my my profile knows that you know I like an aisle seat, that I fly a certain airline, and that I uh, um, prefer a mobile boarding pass, and I want alerts on whether my plane is late through text, um, not through email, so I can get it right away. All that stuff is set up, and and uh, I know the cost, um, and I can pick you know the time of day in which I'm going to come uh, and 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 fly that plane. Um, or uh, ride in that in that plane ride. Um, I think those things um, uh, need to absolutely evolve into healthcare at some point. You know, healthcare certainly isn't hamburgers, transmissions, or airline or or, or a plane ride. Um, but at the same time, if you tried to call up a, a provider and ask, you know, what time could you see me? Um, that typically involves a, a dialogue and, and some level of telephonic discussion. It's rarely electronic. Um, and when you start talking about the services that you're going to get and which level that they're going to be at and also the, the prices that are surrounding those and then ultimately what you as a consumer will be paying as a, cu as a, as a patient, um, that gets very, very dark um, in the current uh, technology. And so I think we can learn some things the book talks about from that. We're not going to learn everything, but you know that last chapter of the book is called Wouldn't It Be Nice? And wouldn't it be nice if when you buy a plane ticket it was just like uh, – or I'm sorry – wouldn't it be nice if, if when you onboarded to your health care, it was a similar experience as when you were shopping for a plane ticket um, and that you knew those things and how much the coverage was, 
when the plane was going to take off and when your care was going to happen, what your options were for choices of care, be it you know primary care, urgent care, those types of things. There are inputs to that, but we haven't gotten to that level of trust or technology to afford that patient as a payer consumer experience that we all want um, as patients. Yeah, so let's talk about those future funding mechanisms because um, as you uh, intimate in, your, in the title of the book, the patient's going to be the new payer. They are the new payer. Um, and so how healthcare gets paid for is is going to be dramatically different going forward. And you cover um, different versions of what that could look like uh, all the way from, from self-pay to uh, universal coverage of, of different kinds. So let's talk about a few of them. And you start out by delving into how hospitals, first off, could better engage patients early on in the process about payment plans, uh, things like loans and charity care and so on. So you know, how, how can hospitals be engaging patients better uh, around those kinds of options? Yeah, I think, you know, hospitals are doing the best they can with what they have. You know, their, their first goal, and the book talks about this as well, is, you know, really to get that patient into where they need to be and start assessing and, and, and running tests to get them well in the most efficient way they can. And, um, you know, uh, the coverage and cost of that element has kind of been unbridled for the most part over the last couple decades. And so patients have had to self-navigate that for the most part. They're asking, you know, hospitals pretty difficult questions about, hey, are you in my network? How much is this going to cost? Do you take my insurance? I have a $1,000 deductible. How much is this going to pay? Or they may not be asking any of those questions. And so what I think providers can do is really they need to engage that patient early. And by engaging them, I mean, hey, you know, we've got a clinical plan. Let's talk about your financial plan, too. What does that look like? You know, um, you know, we, we can run a pre-service estimate for you and, and check your coverage and understand what your out-of-pocket is, but we want to help you navigate those costs, uh, be it through uh, payments over time, loans, or even possibly, you know, having charity or financial assistance navigation help, uh, you know, as they go. I think that process happens, uh, you know, at or after. It doesn't happen as prevalently as we as consumers would like at the front. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's a function of resources and time. Um, I was a chief revenue officer at a hospital for a long time, and, um, you know, I had to focus on blocking and tackling a lot. You know, what were the tasks that absolutely needed to get done today? And those were saying hello to a patient, registering them, making sure I had the right one, um, adding charges to their account, sending that bill out and getting paid for it, um, and then, you know, Calling a patient beforehand meant I had to have a, a person that would do that. And sometimes if I only had 10 people and I needed, I needed 12 to do it, I couldn't take two um, from the folks that were doing all those other things I talked about. So it really is an investment. I think patients have choices these days about their level of care and where they're going to go. And they are starting to shop more and more. And I think the, 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 the providers that do it well to where they are reaching the patient in the way they want to be reached, be that through mobile the web or, or, or even their phone are going to find that that patient's going to value that experience more because they help them all the way instead of just part of the way. Do you have any thoughts on how you manage sticker shock? You know, I think we talked about some of the analogs and more B2C or, you know, retail um, right. parts uh, of, of how our, our consumers um, live their lives, but, you know, and they kind of expect, right, when you're going to go in and have your car repairs, there's going to be a bill and I got to pay for that bill. Um, but if you've got insurance or you think you've got insurance and you go to the hospital and they say, no, you know, you really need to pay the first $3,000 out of your own pocket and, and they just didn't, didn't have that in mind, um, how do you as a hospital engage with them around that and get them to understand that and, and moderate that discussion? Yeah. I think, you know, where, where, where I started is, you know, the, the insurance coverage is a contract between you and your insurance company, and, and we're happy as a, as a provider to be able to, you know, uh, submit those claims to them on your behalf. Um, but, frankly, the, the amount that's owed or what you're paying in your premium and the level of coverage was something that you, you know, did through your employer or yourself, right? Um, I think benefits literacy is an opportunity in our country. The book talks about that a little bit as well. And what benefits literacy is is that we shop and purchase our health care in a pretty rapid format. I don't know that we look at things beyond maybe an inpatient copay or an ER copay or maybe a, a, um, a, a, a labor and delivery um, uh, copay, maybe labs and things. But we'll maybe get to five or six things that we think might come up, a script, if you will. Um, most health care is, frankly, you know, not pre-planned. Um, and so because of that, you know, that sticker shock is part of it if you don't arm yourself with educating, you know, what that plan looks like. 
some ideas on that are, you know, when, when employers are, are, are selling their plans, uh, that they go a little deeper in their discussion in terms of the benefit plan package and maybe run through some scenarios. I've seen some pretty innovative um, companies that we've talked through at, at TransUnion even, um, you know, have these health fairs, if you will, and they kind of talk through scenarios for a knee replacement or a typical, you know, broken bone in the emergency room or a, a, a childbirth or a, uh, um, uh, uh, God forbid, you know, a, a cancer diagnosis and what that looks like across the benefit packages that you purchase so that you're educating yourselves so that you know that those things happen. Um, we all know what tires cost and we all know what a, a, a plane ticket should probably cost and maybe a, 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 um, a night out to dinner, right? And that's because we go and do those things and we became familiar with it. And we're more savvy in that space. We aren't interacting with the healthcare system as much. So we have to kind of be proactive in that as we're purchasing and using these plans. And there's lots of tools and technology out there TransUnion has as well you know, that can help through provider portals, through pre-service estimates, through benefit verifications, and helping, you know, uh, really patients as payers understand the level of coverage that they have and how it's funding the care that they have or not, and then what are those financing options going forward from there. And in the book, you also touch on what I think are some perhaps less publicized payment types. So let's talk about those for a minute. Um, so can you talk about healthcare sharing ministries and how hospitals work with them? Yeah, so um, those are a, a pretty innovative, I'll, I'll use that word, <laughs> uh, uh, method. You know, the, the, these ministry sharing plans, I think, you know, um, some of the very large churches in our country, you know, could have a congregation of, you know, thousands of members. Well, they've, they've decided um, to create a, um, a, 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 a health cooperative. It's not insurance. It's basically a, a, it's, 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 it's the closest thing I can think of it is a health savings account, but it's not. And there's actually a lot of debate about these plans and where they fit because they don't really follow a rule called ERISA, and they don't really follow the tax code either. They're kind of, a, believe it or not, pass the basket around the congregation when someone's sick, and let's try to fund it that way. And then you could become a member of that by paying the church a, a, um, uh, uh, a membership fee. It's not a premium. <laughs> right. and, you, and, you, and you do it. Um, it, you know, it, it works, I think, for the most part for stuff that's, that's uh, uh, you know, pretty routine in nature. But you start having an a, a adverse event, a, a motor vehicle accident, a, a gunshot wound, um, a heart attack, a uh, neurological tumor, something like that. You move very quickly from tens of thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so when that basket um, cannot cover that anymore, there's a gap between what it can do and what insurance can do. Um, I, you know, everyone loves to hate insurance companies, but, you know, I work for one as well. They do have a role in managing utilization and cost to where healthcare is accessible to a consumer. Uh, in the book, I talk about imagining a world where, or imagine a world where you had to approach a provider with nothing, right, and, 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 and going and, and having to negotiate on your own behalf whatever the prices were, and they say, well, yeah, it's, you know, $50,000 to save your life or $25,000 for this pill. And I think self-pay patients are navigating that now, the uninsured, um, and, and that's, that's tough. Hospitals will absolutely work with you and, and have you pay within your ability, um, but, but if, you, if, if, if uh, you, people's lives can get significantly damaged financially from an unexpected medical bill, it's still the number one cause of bankruptcy. So I think these churches have realized that, that they don't want that to happen, and it's, it's certainly a, a Band-Aid. I don't know that it's a solution, but it's one that's out there to where they're trying to cost share um, across the congregation to fund their, their members' care. Um, it's interesting, though, that they don't have to pay or follow the rules that an insurance company or an HSA or an MSA would have to follow in those plans from what I understand. Yeah, and you also touch on vouchers, Jonathan. Um, so what are some of the potential benefits of vouchers, and, and how, how would they work if we were to go into some kind of a system that included those? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of vouchers, I think, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying that. But I think, you know, part of the, the, the issue with health insurance now is that it's, it's not very portable. Um, it's typically attached to your employer, right, wrong or indifferent, or the government, right? And you may have two or three choices in a model like that, but it really is the one that that employer has negotiated on your behalf or the government has negotiated on your behalf through the VA or Medicare or Medicaid, right? And those are your choices. So if you're over 65, you, you automatically get Medicare. You don't really have a choice to, to not get it. 
um, and, and you may be healthy, maybe you want a plan that has more coverage, you can get a supplemental plan or maybe a Medicare Advantage plan or there's even early retirement ones out there. My point is, is that people automatically get that coverage or um, in your employer group, you know, it's part of your benefits package. And so what vouchers do is they kind of open that up to say, you know, I'm going to go and get coverage in an open marketplace to the place that I feel best represents my needs. We still have that benefits literacy um, uh, hurdle that I mentioned before to where we don't want patients necessarily under insuring themselves to where they're buying a catastrophic plan that they can't afford with that has a $25,000 deductible and they hope that that will never happen. But nonetheless, I think it would open the market up to where, um, you know, if, if, if these vouchers were provided, I think um, uh, folks would be able to look at the market find a plan. We've got a lot of education to do there, though, to make sure that patients are buying a plan that's going to meet their needs and, and, and walking through those scenarios like you and I talked about in terms of, hey, you know, you're a 35-year-old male, um, you know, a, a heart, a plan that has coverage, you know, that, that covers hearts and, and, and cardiac work is probably not something that we really need to focus on, but one that covers, you know, orthopedic injury might be. And the plans kind of need to tailor that, too. And, um, and then, uh, but we're, we're held kind of legislatively um, to minimal essential benefits, and, 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 and vouchers may help uh, break that down. We've heard um, uh, just recently with some of the tax reform things that have happened that, and some of the ACA stuff, that we're, we're starting to see um, uh, that health insurance really was not designed to cover everything for everyone. And because we've tried to make it that, it's became extremely expensive and difficult to understand where if it's covering some things for someone, that changes some of that policy and, and maybe vouchers is a way to get there. It's an extremely comp, uh, complex delivery mechanism and, and I think vouchers are but one part of the solution, but I think that allows folks to have more choices and more competition in the healthcare uh, space and that allows uh, our a, a, a more consumer experience versus, hey, here's your insurance plan and here's the network that you must go and um, and do what they tell you, please. I think that, that creates uh, alignment for care delivery, but it also restricts um, it down to that level of providers and, and, uh, and, and there, there isn't a, a, a discussion about cost or, or outcome, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Um... And earlier on in our discussion, you did mention um, a, the section at the end of the book called Wouldn't It Be Nice? And in there, you have several ideas mm -hmm. for how to engage patients about the financial aspects of their care. Why don't you tell us about a few of your favorite ones? Yeah, so, you know, I think we talked about the airline one, but, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could board our health care like we board a plane, I think was one of the, my favorites. And that was just, you know, hey, if, if something happens, um, you know, uh, be it, and usually it's unexpected, but, um, you know, I'm pregnant, I broke my leg, I sprained my ankle, I have a fever, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a kind of a tech geek, and I follow that stuff pretty closely in terms of how technology could leverage that. Um, think of how that could go, you know, hey, I'm hungry, I want to go eat somewhere, let's look up a place, and you start talking about apps like Yelp or Open Table or uh, TripAdvisor, um, or hey, let's go on vacation, you know, you're looking at Trivago or Orbits or, um, uh, you know, you, you know the other ones, Travelocity, you, you, you name it. Um, all of those things have done is brought the services to the consumer. You know, healthcare could benefit from that too. Hey, oh, you sprained your ankle. Well, what, you know, which ankle, what type of sprain? There's a lot of technology out there that's really starting to let a patient self-direct. And they shouldn't self-direct on chest pain. You know, that should be 911 all day long, you know, or, or car wreck and things like that. But, you know, uh, that's, believe it or not, the minority of care are those really, really emergent things. I'd say, you know, three out of four things that happen um, really are things that the patient can could have some input as to where they could go get that care. About 25% of it are things where ambulances need to do it, correct? And so, um, you know, I serve on the HIMSS Revenue Cycle Task Force, and one of the things that we've talked about in there is this patient financial experience of the future to where, you know, you use your iPad or your 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 um your your droid phone and you're like hey I rolled my ankle all right which ankle and it goes through this path and it's like okay well according to your profile you can go to any one of the following places an emergency room a primary care physician clinic a hospital um you know and each one is this far away this one has this long of wait this is how much they cost TransUnion's you know inputting data into applications like that as well um in our plans so that 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 that'll help patients understand what their costs are what coverage they're eligible for, those types of things. I think that's one. 
Um, I think another one would be, wouldn't it be nice if, if uh, you know, health insurance wasn't so expensive um, and, 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 and we were accountable to the amount of coverage we have? Um, those of us that have children, the example I have in that paragraph are um, if we've had children and they became a teenager and, 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 and got on our uh, car insurance, we knew exactly what happened, right? Our car insurance um, goes up quite a bit when uh, a teenager becomes 16, not because it's, it, it's wrong, it's because that's a high-risk thing. Our insurance isn't necessarily based um, directly on risk, and we as a society haven't allowed for that. But, you know, if you smoke cigarettes, I think that's the only exception. But, you know, if your cholesterol or your um, alcohol consumption or your uh, – we can list a bunch of other things are in play. Should that insurance be more expensive? I'm of the, of the, uh, of the opinion that it should be. And insurance should reflect the amount of risk in which you're doing it. That's how life insurance, home insurance, auto vehicle insurance, um, uh, all the other insurances work. But health insurance in our country – um, has some very interesting rules about how um, it needs to be um, an entitlement, if you will, to everyone. And that's created affordability and premium, but I think higher out-of-pocket costs um, in, uh, uh, in deductibles and um, some higher premiums when you start looking at exchange plans and things. Um, I think a third one that I, I don't have the book in front of me, but a third one um, that was interesting is uh, when I said wouldn't it be nice is we have – um, a, a rule called EMTALA. So, you know, wouldn't it be nice if EMTALA didn't exist? Well, you know, what, what that one talks about is EMTALA is the Emergency Medicine and Active Treatment Labor Act. And what that means is, is that when a patient shows up on a property of a hospital, the hospital is obligated to treat them regardless of their ability to pay. Great rule, right, with great intentions. And I think the rule itself on first blush is great. The issue that it presents is that um, patients approach emergency rooms a lot, and that hospital is obligated to treat them before they do anything. And so without payment or regard to level of care or anything, the care process happens. And, and I think some lessening of the Intala rules or some clarifying of rules of the rules would, would be able to say, you know, hey, Mr. Wick, you came here for, for a, 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 a sprained ankle. You know, you're welcome to come back to the emergency room, and we could bandage that up for you and do it. But it's twelve thousand or twelve hundred dollars. Um, the urgent care across the street is six hundred, or we have an urgent care here. Or you know, Dr. Smith is right across the street. He's an orthopedist. He's got an X-ray machine. He could do it as well. But that triaging by level of care can't happen under Amtala directly, and it creates unintended cost and overutilization consequences because of it. And so I said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if if uh, we were able to treat patients at the level of care that they really needed versus to meet some sort of regulation in the book? And the book's an interesting read, Jonathan. If someone wanted to get a copy of it, where can Great. they go? Um, you can go to Amazon and get it if you search my name. I mean, we are donating the profits to charity, which I think is great. Um, and uh, it's out there. It's uh, The patient is the new – or I'm sorry – uh, the book is called Healthcare Revolution. The patient is the new pair. And, and if you search my name, Jonathan Wick, W-I-I-K, you can find it on Amazon. And um, I go out and get it. People have, have seemed to really like it. And it's it's meant to kind of um, make you react. And I think that was my intention in writing it, is that I wanted folks to kind of wake up and look at what's happening with healthcare and understand that we have to take it back as a country and understand what those costs are and really hold the whole system accountable to what's getting paid for from the patient, provider, employer, and government perspective. Good thoughts. Thanks for joining us today on the Hospital Finance Podcast, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. If you have a topic that you'd like us to discuss on the Hospital Finance Podcast, or if you'd like to be a guest, drop us a line at update at Bessler.com. This concludes today's episode of the Hospital Finance Podcast. For show notes and additional resources to help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital, visit Bessler.com forward slash podcasts. The Hospital Finance Podcast is a production of Bessler. Smart about revenue, tenacious about results.